but you're all very welcome uh, this morning to um, the HCI's uh, webinar. So today we're going to be looking at um, a HICWA report summary and we're going to be discussing some of the points that came up. First of all, my name is Una Gilbarry and I'm the CTO of Healthcare Informed. I've done a number of these now. We had, uh, we had good sessions previously in relation to infection control um, and uh, we, uh, we we'll hope to provide you with a, with a lot of information today um, so that we can, uh, I suppose, get a little bit of exposure to the information that's out there and take some of the learnings that we have with it. We also completed last month our fire safety, uh, a review of the HICWA um, fire prevention handbook, which was uh, which was interesting for you all to say the least. I think there was a, that there's a lot of information there. So hopefully we'll 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 cover some of those tracks again today, um, and and we'll have a chat in that regard. Okay, so let's kick off, um, and, and we'll we'll have a little look. Just the the party political broadcast before we start it all. So those of you who know HCI, uh, we're the leading professional services provider of resident safety, regulatory compliance, and quality improvement intelligence and support to health and safety care organisations. So what does that mean? It means that we're there to support services like yourselves in the implementation of regulation, but with the focus of person-centred care. So we have a number of, of quality and safety specialists, uh, quality information system specialists. So we're utilising. Uh, software programs to support uh, information and trend analysis. And the area that I personally work in is, is best practice, uh, where we're actually looking at um, all of the, the evidence that's out there, taking the learnings from it, and then looking to the future and looking to ensure that we have the tools and techniques that we require um, to make sure um, that we can implement it with uh, th that focus, as I said, on person-centered care um, and ensuring that it also supports a business model, which we also have to do. Okay, so that's all of that out of the way. Um, what I want to do now is just, I suppose, consider why we're doing this. And I suppose this is a process that HCI have been in involved in for, for a number of years, where we're taking the information that's out there within uh, the sector and trending it and analyzing it and see what can we identify from the learnings in relation to that information. And when we analyze this, it gives us an opportunity to consider, well, you know, in relation to my service, are we meeting uh, the requirements with the information that's there? Can we benchmark ourselves against that and see if there are improvements that we can implement before it actually comes to our own do doorstep? We, we've just completed a very big piece of reach, research in relation to analysing um, some of the serious incident reviews that have happened within the UK and Ireland and identifying again the continuation of the trends and the patterns that seem to repeat themselves over and over. And what we're trying to do, I suppose, is to try and stop the pattern and take the learnings from the issues that have occurred and ensure that they don't occur as we move forward. So it's very similar to the type of work that we're doing here in relation uh, to the analysis for, for, um, for the HICWA reports. Before I start looking at our own internal analysis, that we completed quite recently. It, it's interesting to note that HICWA just recently, just in, in December of last year, they released their overview report um, in relation to the inspections completed. Now, this is back in 2019. Now, I know 2020, as you I, you don't need me to tell you, in, in relation to, to, to that, 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 that incredibly difficult time, but I suppose they went back to the 2019 element prior to the COVID and completed their own analysis on the trends and the findings. And within that document, and again, they're writing the 2019 findings with, uh, with the current view. Um, and what we have to be mindful is, again, identifying the information that's coming out of this and seeing, well, what are the key areas of focus now coming from this as we move forward, please God, post-COVID. Post so in relation to the inspections in 2019, that the, the, the key areas of concern were, unsurprisingly, and we'll talk about it at length, is governance and management. They had also particular concerns in relation to persons in charge. Fire safety was coming up the ranks, so it was moving up the ranks in 2019. It's certainly going to be the big story uh, as we move into 2021-2022, uh, and again, concerns in relation to premises. And they 
completed a chart which I thought was quite, um, uh, quite quite interesting, and we're going to look at it then in comparison to the findings that we had. But their their number one finding for both 2018 and 2019 related to premises. And we know that there are a lot of restrictions in relation to premises in relation to what we can do. So it's worth taking a little bit of time of considering what type of findings they were finding, or they were detailing within premises and how we can try and counteract that uh, as best we can within the limitations that are there. So we're gonna look at that in a little while. Unsurprisingly there again, fire precautions were raising their head quite early on. So in 2019, and it was lining up very much for a thematic inspection in 2020 uh, on, on, until all our plans got scuppered. So we can see now with the release of that handbook that the push is really coming on in relation to fire precautions. We've had a full seminar or webinar on that previously, and, and we'll briefly touch on it again today. Governance and management. Those of you who know HCI know that it's it's our it's our number one uh, point of contact. Here it was the third highest finding um, in in two thousand and, and, and in eighteen, and again I think it's the fourth in relation to two thousand and nineteen. Oh, the third. So again, we can see that. The key area that we look at this is governance and management is always looked at. Fire and precautions are not always looked at. So if we take it as an overall process, governance and management is always really the number one finding. It's just uh, that some of the other ones, uh, it, it depends on, on, on the, the, the quantity of findings that are related to it. Records were very high in relation in 2018, but dropped back in 2019. So they saw a, pr a progression and improvement in that area. And the same again in residence rights. Again, it dropped from the 26% of findings down to about 20%, still a significant um, amount of findings in relation to it. Risk management coming in at 17, but the surprising one there is in infection control. So if you're looking at 2019 findings prior to COVID, 16% uh, had findings in relation to infection control. Now, if we look back now and we have our, 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 our the knowledge of experience and those, those glasses on us, we can see that if we were really, or if there was really a push uh, from Hickway in relation to the national standards for infection prevention control in community settings, that would have been much, much higher. Um, so... I think it's fair to say that there wasn't the same level of focus on it. I mean, obviously what we've experienced now in the last year, but in 2018, 2019, it was ticking along. It was there, there about in the lo lower stages, but there wasn't that intense focus on it in relation to it. Personal possessions quite high in 18, dropping down in 19. Training and staff there, thereabouts around the 12% and individual care planning. So they're the trends that were coming through in 18 and 19. And now we're going to look at those in a little while, but in, in comparison to the trends that we now see in the reports. A couple of things I just wanted to pull out of that report, again, written in December 2020, so not that long ago, um, they detailed that for governance and management, and we've said this, I suppose, throughout all of the, of the webinars, they see that as the key indicator for, for the performance of a nursing home. And they've detailed that they found that quite disappointing, um, that, that it is continues to be a reoccurring tre trend. And if we think back to our fire safety training and our infection uh, control, uh, the webinar is completed on that, the push model was always in the governance model in each area. So it's not just governance and management generally, it's governance and management specifically to fire safety and governance and management models specifically to infection prevention control and building up the robustness and the comprehensiveness of that governance model that's there to support it. So they say quite simply, the registered provider is the legal entity responsible. And when the registered provider cannot demonstrate clear lines of authority and accountability with effective monitoring and quality insurance, this typically leads to a service that cannot sustainably deliver good quality care or outcomes. So they're very much pushing the book uh, directly at the feet of the registered provider and pushing for that robust model uh, to be implemented. A point that I thought was really uh, interesting of the 23 uh, percent that were deemed not compliant. They also aligned rates of other non-compliance when governance and management was out of sync. So, and there we are at the very top. We see if there's not a good, good governance and management model, 
then fire precautions generally will fall by the wayside. Because generally within an organization, there are other individuals to take on the roles and responsibilities, I suppose specifically relating to direct care. But in many cases, elements like fire safety or premises said, well, that's the registered provider's job. And if that individual or that, that group isn't strong enough to carry that, then that model starts to collapse. And that's why you have the high rate of findings. It was surprising to see, I suppose, infection control down at 5%. Whereas when we look at the HICWA reports that came out subsequent to that, when they were reviewing the COVID-19 aspect of it, they, they very much uh, were pushing that if your governance model wasn't correct, your, your infection control was going to be in, in, in significant uh, trouble. So they are identifying those links. If you have a problem in governance, likelihood is you're going to have problems in these key areas. So when they come into a service and they identify problems at the outset from governance, they're going to start to zone in these particular areas um, in relation to it. As I said, with fire precautions, it was on the radar at that stage. And I'd say that handbook was, was really ready to roll out much earlier than now. But they saw that there was a, um, a slight decrease in 2018. However, there were a large number of areas where there were repeats. So again, poor senior management oversight of the fire safety measures, absence of suitable risk identification systems, uh, large fire compartments for horizontal evacuation, poor outcomes from fire drills. So again, that lack of knowledge and experience uh, within the organization to support a really effective fire, uh, fire program, inadequate measures for containing fire and means of escape for residents and staff. So, you know, the indicators were there that there were significant problems in relation to it. I just wanted to flag up premises. And again, they do detail within the report that problems within the physical environment in, in nursing homes has been persistent and that they want to monitor the situation uh, closely. But their key focus was about trying to get organizations to consider other ways of improving the quality of life of the resident. So if there are restrictions in relation to premises and many facilities are, are restricted and it is beyond their control, they're looking to, you, to, to services to now consider other ways of improving the quality of life and that really to try and think outside the box and, and, and be a, a innovative in that regard. So onto the report that we completed ourselves. Um, so as I said, we generally complete something like uh, this type of report every quarter. Um, and, and again, why do we do it? We want to try and learn from the information that's out there. We certainly want to see, as we would say, what's hot right now, what's the, the particular areas of focus um, of, of inspectors when they're out on site. And again, obviously benchmarking uh, facilities. So say, okay, you know, are there particular areas um, our findings that were there that we may not have been aware that that would be the approach of the HICWA inspectors in relation to it. So I said 24 randomly inspected, all of these reports were released between December last year and March of this year. Um, and, and, and we wanted to, to, as I said, look at those key areas of interest and the types of findings that were coming out under the regulations. Might be a little bit difficult to see these two graphs, but we're going to go into detail in them in a little while anyway, so I wouldn't get too excited. And I would say this report will be available to you all. You're more than welcome to have it. Uh, after this, Rosemary will look after sending it through to you. But I just wanted, I suppose, to flag up some of the key areas and we're going to be looking at these. And this is from the, 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 the capacity and capability dimension. So some of the key areas there from staffing. So of the 24 reports that were reviewed, all 24 of them uh, had reviewed were, were reviewed for staffing and of those 33 percent of a third of those were found to be uh, not compliant with four percent falling in in the high risk and the remaining 29 in in the moderate which is still a significant uh, a significant chunk very comparable again in the training and development regulation 33 percent but in this case eight percent of these were seen as as warranting a red non-compliant risk governance and management all 24 again were reviewed in relation to this. And of that, 50% of them were carrying non conformances which is really significant. And 17% of those being high risk. So this is a significant push in this area and, and a, a lot of focus because again, they're seeing those indicators. If you have a weak governance model in particular areas, it drives out into the other sectors of the, of the service being provided. Complaints, 
coming in around 19% uh, non-compliant, but something also worth considering. And we'll just have a quick uh, look later on about some of the areas in that. Now we're getting into the quality and safety dimension. And then for premises, now only 17 of the 24 review, reviewed them, but of that, just under 60% uh, coming in as non-compliant. Interestingly, all falling in under non-compliant orange because of the restrictions that are there. I suppose there is a certain amount um, of flexibility in relation to it. Infection control, not surprisingly, all, all uh, 24 reviewed. And in that, 48% or 46% uh, deemed not compliant with 8% coming in at high risk. Now, the big one, fire precautions, we can see the push was certainly on from since, since December through into March, 75% uh, not compliant. Now, only 16 reviewed, and I was quite surprised by that. And I think when we do this review in the next quarter, you will see all 24 are going to be reviewed uh, against the fire precautions, preparing that, that big push uh, for the, for the, the HICWA um, the, the HICWA guideline that's been released. So 75%, 19 of those high risk, that's a lot, 19% and remaining 56 in orange. Uh, medication always continually take a long surprise that really only seven, seven of the 24 reviewed, uh, but of those 28% coming in is not compliant. So we're going to look at these and just see if we can identify some key learnings uh, for, from the analysis that was coming here. So this is just really a summary. So we saw, so our top ranking ones was fire precaution coming in at 75, premises at 59, governance and management at 50, infection control at 46, and training and staff development at 33. And again, just comparing that against uh, what was coming through in 2019, again, governance and management, fire safety, premises, it's the continuing trends that relate to it. And I just wanted to do this comparison chart just to show you again. So the HCI, branch being the, the lime green. So we can see the dramatic pushes in the particular area. So fire precautions coming way out now, a lot of focus on that. Obviously, uh, your premises being supporting with the, generally working hand in hand with the fire precautions. Um, governance and management, obviously a 50%, a big chunk of change. And then unsurprisingly, infection control and linking to that, the training and staff development. Training and staff development generally, we'll see as we go through the slides, is coming up due to lack of training and staff development, either in infection control, but more so now, the lack of training and staff development in relation to fire safety. So if fire safety is being reviewed, you can be guaranteed that premises will also be reviewed. Governance and management obviously will always be reviewed. And also that training and staff development is going to be reviewed because they really kind of push through as a bundle. So interesting changes are transitions there, but still the same key areas coming out on top uh, as particular issues, uh, non-compliant findings. So we're going to spend a little bit of time looking at the governance and management and the key areas of focus that they had in relation to that. So as I said, 50% of, of the 24 reviewed. So there's a failure on behalf of the registered provider to maintain oversight, the quality and safety uh, of care in the centre. The registered provider had abdicated its responsibility and was failing in accountability as required by the Act for the overall quality and safety of the services. So again, from, from point A, it's, it's, it's analysing that governance model that's there and seeing the roles and responsibilities that are taken on. And I, I suppose that it's an interesting use of the word that they abdicated their responsibility. So it's not my job. That's the PIC's job. That's the, 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 the clinical nurse manager's job. That's somebody else's job. But at the end of the day, they saw that as the overall responsibility lies with, with, with the RP. So I thought that was an interesting one to pull up. And these are all a mix of findings then that we've, we've pulled out in relation to it. There was a lack of clearly defined management structure. They identified lines of authority and accountability. There was no specific roles or details, the responsibilities for all the, the areas of care provision. And we'll see this in relation to, um, as, as we move through it, 
the requirement for the effective uh, layout of that governance model in relation to the teams that are in place and um, the agendas, the terms of reference that must be carried within those teams and those individual roles and responsibilities. And, you know, the, the power of those job descriptions to having a really detailed uh, job description where there's a clear understanding of the roles and responsibilities that are expected of individuals uh, within the organization. This was an interesting one. Clinical oversight is, require, uh, is required uh, to ensure effective and safe delivery of care. I thought that was interesting, particularly because uh, of that COVID-19 expert panel report where they were discussing that requirement for clinical governance oversight committee. So obviously with the, within those recommendations, they are filtering, they're being carried by, by HICWA, and it's probably an area we're going to see more and more focus on where you'll start to see these type of findings filtering through talking about clinical oversight in relation to the service and, 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 the, and the governance structure. They felt that the communication between members and the management team was informal, um, that it did not ensure the service was managed in line with statement of purpose or policies and procedures. As I said, this was what I was talking about here. The minutes weren't very reflective. There was no agenda. There was no terms of reference. They were vague. They weren't, they were, there was no clarity in relation to who was responsible for what uh, as an outcome of these meetings. So we need to have a much more structured approach in relation to those very, very important uh, management team meetings. Increased oversight was required by the management team in relation to fire precautions. Uh, social program for residents, infection control practices, staff ensuring staff records are maintained and the monitoring of the service. So again, looking at that, um, the, the, the oversight and, and the organizational structure that's in place, the governance model to be able to support these particular areas throughout the organization to ensure that they're filtered from the top down and that they move out as a culture within the organization. Another quick one, uh, I thought this was interesting. The inspector found that a person in charge was the only senior person on the roster to carry out a supernumerary capacity available to support staff and responsible for carrying out routine oversight activities such as audit and KPIs. The clinical nurse manager did not have any designated administrative time to provide support to the PIC. So again, even if we have these excellent jobs descriptions and it says you're responsible for this and you're responsible for that and you're responsible for the other, they're also looking past it and saying, well, if you have given these responsibilities to, to, to individuals within your team, you have to be able to provide them with the capacity to implement those activities. You know, in many cases within the report, we saw that there were um, PICs or CNMs working as staff nurses on the floor. And as a result, all of that governance and oversight model really was fallen by the wayside where they were working in, in, in direct care capacity. And that was totally understandable within the COVID-19 emergency that was there, but they're now looking for that model to ensure that that capacity is there to, to, to do the overall governance um, and analysis and monitoring that's required by the service. Audit again came up as a problem, no audit schedules, uh, the system wasn't robust. It was a tick box system. There was no smart action plans coming out. The audit tools were very basic. They weren't effectively monitoring it. And again, there was no learnings coming through from the audit, no formalized systems of ensuring and disseminating the, and communicating those findings out through staff. I thought it was interesting in relation to this, um, as I said, the impact on the COVID-19 on the Nursing Homes Ireland, that was the HICWA report. Uh, they said, uh, that the governance and management was carrying the highest rate of non-conformance with staffing and infection control only coming in third. So even when they were going in on site and they were just like the primary focus obviously was infection control, the majority of the findings fell under governance. And I think that'll still be the case when we, if we move forward towards the fire safety, the majority of the findings will fall under governance. And, and obviously supported then by, by the fire safety. But they, as I said, they are pushing that responsibility uh, onto the governance model in relation to it. 
Fire precautions, we've had a whole sem uh, webinar on this previously, but I just wanted to skim over some of the key findings. Staff being insufficiently trained or experienced to manage their roles and responsibilities in fire safety. And we talked at length about this in the previous webinar about ensuring that we have access to that competent person, somebody who is sufficiently experienced to be able to support the organization in their responsibilities. And, and, and that is certainly central to it. They had significant and serious concerns regarding the safety evacuation of residents, large compartments, horizontal and vertical um, evacuations not being uh, uh, appropriate, um, and, and, and looking at the fire safety reviews and, and benchmarking the organization against best practice. Simulated fire drills and nighttime staffing conditions evidence poor evacuation timelines. Uh, for example, it took nine minutes in one case for three staff to evacuate 10 residents. So again, a particular focus on that nighttime element. And, and we're going to look at that in a little while uh, when we talk about staffing. But when we have set levels of dependencies for residents and we have uh, their, their uh, personal evacuation plans in place that may demand or require that they would have um, a specific level of support, we need to ensure that our skill mix and our, our, our staff rotas that are put in place for those night times are sufficient to be able to support those uh, evacuation requirements. And that's certainly an area that they're going to be drilling down and said so dependency levels are one thing, your PEPs are another thing, but are you in a position to be able to support that level um, uh, that, that, or provide the level of support that's required when an evacuation is required? Again, full compartment evacuation not undertaken with nighttime staffing levels of simulation. Uh, the PSC didn't, did not ensure the procedures uh, were adequately displayed. Fire safety training had expired and, and electrical systems had required certification. There was no maintenance of the fire equipment. Emergency lighting wasn't being serviced. Um, adequate arrangements had not been taken for the detection of fire, uh, of fire. The stairs enclosure was not fitted with the smoke detector. The inspector involved, the doors didn't seal. And this seems to be, that is a repeated finding throughout uh, the analysis that we completed in relation to the fire doors being ineffective and gaps being uh, being there in relation to them. So that's just a quick overview in relation to fires. So we, we've talked at length about that before. And infection control, I didn't, it, we haven't laboured it. There's, there is a, a significant bit of detail in the report, but we, again, we've gone through a lot of these findings before in a previous webinar. Um, but I suppose the primary one is that those practices, again, were not uh, in line with the HPSC guidance um, or, and, 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 the, and the best practice that was over was apply, applicable to it. There was insufficient oversight of the infection control practices staff coming in and off of duty with their uniforms on, no changing facilities provided and staff wearing nail polish and storings. I mean, this is standard practice, but it's surprising to see it coming up still at this stage. Not all staff attending up-to-date training or refresher courses, a lack of knowledge was evident. So there was still uh, uh, some issues in relation to that. Inadequate storage and segregation for to prevent cross-contamination. And again, Legionella coming up again, which was a surprising finding in relation to it. Premises, as I said, 59%. So again, a very big chunk of change of the 17 reviewed. Uh, the registered provider was not providing a premise which conformed to the matter set out in Schedule 5. The major impact was on the daily experience for residents living in the centre. Lack of privacy to perform basic care, noise, risk of infection and fire evacuation risks. Um, so again, that, that, that focus on the person-centered care and the quality of life uh, applicable to it. Communal space was below the recommended uh, four square meters. The layout of the la laundry wasn't right to, to ensure that segregation. So again, linking premises to infection control. Building works were in progress and prevent, presented main risk of injury to residents. Flooring and carpets uh, had significant tears and rips and surfaces were uneven and insufficient bathrooms or showers to meet the requirements of the residents. So again, nothing that we haven't seen previously, but again, I suppose surprising that, that we see them coming up again. Staff training and development then, again, staff supervision and comprehensive audit was required in relation to the management of medicines. So again, uh, 
the, the relevant policies and procedures not being applied in relation to medication, which, which came through in a number of, of the reports. And in the training records, they found gaps in that mandatory training. Again, fire safety, manual handling, safeguarding CPR, and infection control. So, uh, you know, all of these really falling hand in hand with each other. New staff members did not receive training in relation to the emergency procedures. So again, the fire safety, the emergency procedures that are linked to that. Uh, the system for monitoring and, uh, and recording training was not sufficiently robust and did not allow management to have a full oversight of the training requirements. So that, again, that model of review and analysis and ensuring that uh, the appropriate training uh, has, has been completed. Uh, members of the management team who were responsible for audits had not completed the audit training. They, not, they hadn't any, any formal audit training. And again, that's obviously going to undermine the robustness or the effectiveness of the audits being completed by those individuals. Staffing then again, 33% of the, of the full 24 being reviewed. They found that the staffing levels and the current skill mix were not sufficient to meet the needs of residents. And again, as I said, this is something that's going to link in with fire safety where they have the staffing levels were not sufficient to safely evacuate residents from the large compartments. As we know there are no specifics or, uh, in relation to um, the, the staffing levels. But as I said, when you link them to the fire safety and the PEPs, we need to be very considerate um, of, of, of the staffing levels that are, are required to implement them. The inspectors identified a skill mix at nighttime required review as there was only one nurse available after uh, eight o'clock to administer uh, nighttime medication and provide nursing care. And in one instant, a newly recruited nurse was scheduled to work on their own and take charge of the designated centre when the PIC had completed their working day. So somebody taking the acting role of PIC clearly not being sufficiently experienced to be able to take on that role and responsibility. Staffing allocations required reviews that the current arrangement was not make, meeting the occupational and recreational needs of the residents. So again, with that residence focus and, and then the quality of their care, uh, insufficient staffing to be able to support that. Insufficient number of staff on duty where residents were last left unsupervised for long periods of time. Call bells left ringing greater than three minutes. No meaningful activities available. Um, you know, key areas out there. And then again, those call bell audits uh, that should be monitoring our response times did not look at the length of the time that the residents waited uh, when they were calling for assistance. Linking into that, I suppose, in relation to residents' rights and 25% of the 20 reviewed having failings in this area, uh, residents on the first, flare, first floor were unable to use the stairlift and their rights of freedom of movement were restricted. There was no scheduled activities at the time of inspection. They found there was poor oversight of activity provision as care plans were not updated to reflect the residents' needs or preferences as they changed. Staff were not clearly guided to provide appropriate activities or meaningful occupation. So again, that continual ongoing monitoring, update and review and ensuring that preferences are reflected uh, to support quality, uh, quality of life. Improvements are required uh, in relation to the provision of activities for residents with advanced needs. So in many cases, we can have a quite a good activity uh, model in place for, uh, for standard residents, but those with particular needs also need to have focus uh, to be able to support that. Uh, privacy and dignity of residents continue to be impacted. And again, that's going to roll into your premises findings. Beds being located in close proximity to each other. Bays doubled as corridors or thoroughfares to access toilets and shower areas. Space limited. Residents couldn't hang up their pictures. They couldn't see out the window. Um, they found that the inspectors found it was impossible to block the noise or smells pervading throughout the, the, the service. And then the majority of residents in, the, in a facility didn't have access to their own TV. So they're kind of the major significant areas, I suppose, that we looked at within the report. But there were a number of other areas of compliance that I just want to assume to you. I know I'd, I, I don't want to take up too much more of your time. I'll be finishing up uh, quite shortly. Medication management, uh, staff administering medication without a prescription, uh, a number of medic medicines being transcribed without authorization not to transcribe correctly, not signed by the transcriber, or did not detail what route the medication was to be administered. So again, if we're looking for severity of outcomes, medication management is certainly one of the critical areas uh, that require focus. 
In risk management, significant improvements are required in relation to managing environmental risks, again, fire safety and infection prevention control, so it links it through. A robust system for hazard identification and assessment of risk was required to ensure compliance and to ensure safety of residents and staff, so the overall risk management model that's being implemented. Complaints, as I mentioned, in, in the majority of cases, one of the key findings was that there was no evidence of follow-up with the, with the complainant to ensure their, their satisf satisfaction with the outcome or otherwise. Um, Regulation 14, person in charge, which had a high um, non-compliance rating in previous years, if you remember from the graphs, from here, 10% non-compliant and 10% and, um, and were, were substantially compliant. The PSC did not have a post-registration management qualification in health or related field as required by the regulations. The policies and procedures, policies not reviewed or updated within the last three years, and policies not being reflective of requirements or best practice general findings. It's important, I suppose, to note that there were, you know, the, the reports themselves uh, pulled together a lot of feedback from the residents and ensuring that their voices heard. And in general, there was very positive feedback across the board of, of the 24 reports that we looked at. Some residents were unanimous in their praise for the staff of the residential centre. They said the activity and physical therapy sessions were a good diversion during the day. One resident said that they had poor Wi-Fi and need, uh, they, they wanted their own uh, internet access. So I suppose we have transitioned now. We've engaged in that process of uh, um, supporting residents uh, to be able to communicate with the outside world via the Wi-Fi. So we need to be able to support that model. Residents said they felt safe and looked after in the center and, and residents were complimentary of the staff saying they were excellent, friendly, courteous and understanding. So I know it's, it's you know, we look all the time at the non-compliance areas, but, you know, it's really important to see that we, you know, there is so much good work being done and it is so uh, broadly recognised uh, by the residents and by their families uh, in relation to it. So that kind of brings us to the end of today. As I said, it was uh, interesting, I suppose, we, we, we tracked our findings um, against uh, those of 2008 and 2019. And I think it is probably pointing us in the direction of the primary areas of focus as we move forward to uh, 20, 20, the remainder of 2021 and into 2022. Um, so, you know, continually taking those findings, taking those learnings and benchmarking ourselves against them and seeing, you know, how can I ensure that I don't run into these problems, that we ensure that our services are robust as possible and, and, and take the learnings in relation to it. Uh, back to the part of political broadcast, HCI Care Tools is available to all of you on the web. Um, it's, it's a store that, that we, as part of our, our um, um, best practice uh, department, we develop um, a large suite of policies and procedures, forms and tools. Um, that incorporate requirements and best practice and you can utilize to support within your organization. Um, and I think, Rosemary, you're being shocking generous and given 10% discounts, but if they're there and it's available and there is a coupon code there. So if it's a thing, there are particular areas that you're interested in and you'd like to purchase, well, then you can tippity tap that in or contact Rosemary. She loves talking to people. Isn't that right, Rosemary? I do, yeah. <laughs> Any questions coming in, Rosemary? So Helen asks, are HICO aware of the difficulties we have um, getting training done through the pandemic? Yeah, and I, I, I do I, generally, and I mean, I'm, I'm only speaking generally, I think there is a recognition of that. And I think there is a recognition also in relation to um, accessing a, a experience trainers to be able to do that, freeing up people to access the training. But what I do think is really important is that we have a plan in place. And, and generally, um, we are, are quite understanding of that as long as we have a structured plan in place that we have shown that we have a direction or particular focus um, and, and that our, our structure plan is there. I think generally they are understanding of that. What happens is if, if it gets continually kicked down the road, then we can run into some problems. But I do think, and I and I do think they are carrying a certain acceptance of the weary load that that the vast majority have had to carry uh, over the last period of time. So the transition into fire safety, although it is happening as we've seen, it won't be as fire and brimstone as possibly it would have been previously. I mean, there is, I, I think there will be a transition period into it uh, in that regard. But again, I suppose it depends on the knock on the door uh, at any particular day. So uh, Mary asks, will online training suffice in the absence of a personal training? 
person? I think it depends on the type of training. Um, uh, but I think the vast majority of our training, and I know we complete a lot of training for audit and, and, and all of those, those sorts of things. And absolutely, once the training is completed and you have the documented training uh, provided so that you have evidence of the, 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 the content of the training. And if it's by a reputable organization, I think absolutely um, it, it, it is the future you know online training is the future it's 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 uh, a much more appropriate model for our current uh, situation anyway that's it then thanks una uh, just again i suppose to say thank you very much for all of your attendance um and, and taking your time out today and we hope it's of value as said rosemary will be sending around the complete report uh, that you can utilize within you know read your own bedside nighttime reading um and and, and take some time to to consider some of the findings that are there and hopefully it will support you as you go forward. All right. Thank you very much, everybody.